Father, in the name of Jesus, what an honor that I have today to deliver your word. I pray that the entrance of your word will bring understanding. I pray that you will make our hearts fertile grounds for your word. I pray that this word will pierce every part of our lives that will leave changed men and women. As it was in the book of Acts that you, they were all vexed because of the word. I pray that the word will vex our spirits. In Jesus' name. And every believer says, Amen. Amen. In our Bibles, Romans chapter 3. Today I'm so excited because I was tired of telling you bad news. Somebody asked me, Pastor, when are you going to start the real grace? Because every day I was coming and telling you, you are sinners. Today we start, after hearing all those bad news, today we start the what? The grace. So Romans chapter 3 verse 21. Do you want me to read? Do you want to read? You want to read? All right. Romans 3 verse 21. Are you there? In your Bibles, are you there? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Are you there? I want to hear a big yes. Romans, 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 you're there? Okay. We commence reading. One, two, three, go. But now, come on. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is? Uh-huh. God of the Gentiles? Yes. The God of the Gentiles also. found according to the flesh. Thank you. 
Hey, hey. Uh huh. Not while circumcised. Next. Also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So today I want to share grace only. Now the couple of key words that I want you to note in these passages. Number one, grace. And we said grace is unmerited. Grace is what? Unmerited favor. The other word is faith. You're going to hear the word faith, 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 belief. Simply meaning putting your trust in God. And particularly in Romans, it's related with salvation. In order for you to receive salvation, all you need is to put your faith in who? In God. The other word you will hear is justification. Tell your neighbor, justification. That is a formal acquittal by God. Where God pronounces a sinner not guilty. You are justified. God acquits you, meaning you are guilty. You go to court and they say, Joseph, you are what? Guilty. Now for you to be justified, it simply means God says, now that you are guilty, I have forgiven you. That's what they mean to be justified. And we are justified by faith in who? In Christ Jesus. The other word you're going to hear, and I've taught you this, is the word called wrath. Tell your neighbor, wrath. That is the holy anger of God or the righteous anger of God. I want you to note that anger can be righteous or unrighteous. That's why the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4 that do not let the sun go down when you're still what? Angry. Meaning anger is not necessarily wrong, but when you let it slip over, it becomes what? Wrong. But God has a righteous anger. Now the other big word is Propitiation. Tell, tell your neighbor, propitiation. Propitiation. That is the sacrificial act by which the wrath of God is pleased. Now what does that mean? I've also already explained the wrath of God is the holy anger of God. Because God is holy and just. Wherever there is sin, sin has to be what? Punished. Are you getting me? Sin has to be? punished. Now, for you to say God is our propitiation, it means that the sacrifice of Jesus was able to fulfill the wrath of God, the anger of God was satisfied by the sacrifice that was on the cross. So that whole thing, the theologians call it propitiation. God is pleased. He says, now I am satisfied. Because of what Christ has done on the cross. Are we clear? Those words, you're going to meet them as we go through the text. Now, Peter said this. Peter said that Paul writes certain things that are very confusing. That's what Peter wrote in the Bible. He said Paul's writings can be a bit complicated. Last week I taught from chapter 2. And after around four people came to me and told me, when you gave us the homework during the week, we read chapter 2, but we didn't understand. So we came to church to understand it, and we're glad we have understood it. So if you miss the sermon, chapter 1 speaks about man is fallen. People who don't know the Lord, how will they know the Lord? And we said it's through creation. You remember the chart? Then after that, we dealt with homosexuality. Then we went to chapter 2. When we went to chapter 2, we said there are people who are self-righteous and over-righteous. Now, we ended in chapter 3, verse 9, where we said all have sinned. 
Now we take gear to, now that we know we are sinners, we've had enough that we are fallen people, we can do nothing, we are trapped in this sinful nature. What is the solution? It's where we are going. How do you become right with God? What do I need to do to become right with God? That's the million dollar question that everyone asks themselves. The Hindus are asking, how can I be right with God? The Muslims are asking, how can I be right with God? The traditionalists are asking, how can I be right with God? And all those religions have a way to be right with God. But the question I want to answer today, are those methods right? Do they answer the quest of being right before God? Because God is holy. How can a holy God embrace people that he has said from chapter 1 to chapter 3 that are fallen what? People. Now we go to our text. Verse 21. Now the way Paul writes, you will not, I will teach you this, he, he comes with a thought, he leaves that thought, he touches another thought, then he goes back to the thought, so his thoughts he comes in, he goes out, he comes in, and so we're going to put all the things together. So the question I'm answering is, how can you be right before God? In short, it's simply this. How do I get saved? How can I be right with God? If everyone's saying they have the method, let's find out what the Lord says is the right method. Verse 21 says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed so number one he says the righteousness of god cannot be in the law listen to the text he says now the righteousness of god apart from the what i can't hear you the righteousness of god apart from is what simply saying that the law cannot reveal the righteousness of let me go back to the statement he says now but now, of our God, apart from the what? The law. Meaning the law, observing the law, does not reveal the righteousness of God. Are we together? If you say you're going to observe the law, now what was the law? The law was for the Jews. You know the Ten Commandments? They had more than Ten Commandments. They had over 700 laws. That they were supposed to fulfill. But let's just go for the Ten Commandments. You shall not steal. You shall obey your parents. You shall not covet. All those laws. The scripture says by observing them. By not stealing. By honoring your parents. By worshipping only one God. By not co being covetous. All those ten laws. He says if you observe them. You are still not what? Righteous. Now that was fundamentally mind-blowing to the hearers then. Because they had grown up from Old Testament that you need to observe the law in order to please God. You need to observe the law so that God can accept you. Now God says, no, 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 guys. Even if you observe them, I am not pleased. And there's no solution to that. But why would God say that is the question. Because you shall not steal, you shall not covet, you shall obey your parents. Those are good things, right? But God says, you observing them, you are not right before me. Why? James. James chapter 2 verse 10 says this. For whoever shall keep the word. I can't hear you. Let's go together. One, two, three, go. For whoever. Uh-huh. What is it? So what does that statement mean? He says, you can try to keep the law, but God knows that as long as you fail in which one? One. You are what? Guilty. Of how many? Meaning that the law was impossible to keep. So the question is, why was the law there? If it was impossible for you to keep it, why was it there? The law was there. He answers it. Let's go back to 21. The law was there to point us to the Messiah. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is 
revealed. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So he's saying, when you see the law, you are seeing it's a pointer to the righteousness of God. So the law was supposed to point us to the Messiah. How does it point you to the Messiah? It points you, it tells you that, by the way, you can't keep me. So if you cannot keep this law, what should I do? Verse 29, it should be. Verse 20, no, let's go to, because he answers, 26. He says, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. Let's go there. To, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the law was there to help demonstrate at the present time his what? Righteousness. So if you're watching a movie, how many of you love movies? When is the real plot? Is it at the beginning or at the end? At the end. So he's saying the law and the prophet, those were the beginning of the movie. So that the movie will end with Jesus. Now, people have said, it's a wrong doctrine that is going around, especially with famous pastors, that the Old Testament is useless. That's not true. 21, let's go back, please. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Meaning the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation has one key thing. It's all revealing Jesus. It's all revealing who? Jesus. Now let's go for it. Some of you may not know. Genesis reveals Jesus as the seed of the woman. Genesis chapter 3. Exodus reveals Jesus as a Passover lamb. Leviticus reveals Jesus as our high priest. Numbers reveals Jesus as the cloud by day and fire by night. Deuteronomy reveals Jesus as a prophet, the one who takes your curse. Joshua reveals Jesus as the commander of the Lord's army. Judges reveals Jesus as a judge and the lawgiver. Ruth reveals Jesus as our kinsman redeemer. First Samuel and second Samuel reveal Jesus as our prophet, a king. First Kings and Second Kings reveal Jesus. First Kings reveals Jesus as the ruler greater than Solomon. Second King reveals Jesus as king and prophet. First Chronicles reveal Jesus as glorious, beautiful temple. Second Chronicles reveal Jesus as the king who reigns eternally. Ezra reveals Jesus as the faithful scribe. Nehemiah reveals Jesus as the rebuilder of everything broken. Esther reveals as our advocate like Mordecai. Job reveals Jesus as ever-living redeemer. Psalm reveals Jesus as our shepherd. Proverbs reveals Jesus as our wisdom. Ecclesiastics reveal Jesus as our meaning for life. The Song of Solomon reveals Jesus as our loving bridegroom. Isaiah reveals Jesus as the prince of peace. Jeremiah reveals Jesus to us as a righteous bunch. Lamentations, lamentations reveal Jesus as the weeping prophet. Ezekiel, Jesus is revealed as the son of man. Daniel, Jesus is revealed as the fourth man in the fire. Are you in the fire? Jesus is the fourth man in the fire. Hosea reveals Jesus as a faithful husband. Joel reveals Jesus. He is an outpouring of his Holy Spirit. Amos reveals Jesus. He is our burden bearer. Ode. Obadiah, sorry. Obadiah reveals Jesus as our mighty savior. Jonah reveals Jesus as great evangelist. Micah reveals Jesus as our everlasting ruler born in Bethlehem. Nahum reveals Jesus as the avenger of God elect. Habakkuk reveals Jesus, he is the watchman. Zephaniah reveals Jesus, he is the restorer of the remnant. Haggai reveals Jesus as the cleansing fountain. Zechariah reveals Jesus, he is the one pierced for us. And lastly, Malachi reveals Jesus, he is the son of righteousness, righteousness with healing in his wings. Come on, let's give Jesus praise. So, the Old Testament is there to reveal Jesus. Now, let's continue to verse 2. Verse 22, he says this. Even the righteousness of God 
through faith in Jesus Christ, and I'll come back and explain that, to all and in all who believe, for there is no difference. So he highlights something here. He says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who what? Believe. Which is coherent in John where it says, whoever believes in the Son will have eternal life. So he says that this salvation is for all people. It's not just for the Jews. It's not just for the educated. It's not just for the few who can afford to build churches, who can afford to bring tithes. No, 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 no. This salvation we're talking about, this being right before God, is for everyone. Whoever is here and you are lost. Some of you are here and you're saying, Pastor, you don't know the sins I've committed. The Bible says you're a candidate. Oh, you don't know where I have been. You are a candidate. For all in all. All people are included. For God so loved the world. Not for so God loved two people. No. For God so loved the world. Whoever is in this world, you are a candidate to salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So Paul says, even the righteousness of God, which we want, how can we be right before God? Through faith, it's always through faith in Christ Jesus, to all and on all. All of us are candidates. Now I give you the background. The background of this book, there were Jews and Gentiles. The Gentiles thought they had God figured out. Not the Gentiles, the Jews. They knew, first of all, Jesus was a who? A Jew. And some of us behave like Jews. We judge people who are not like us and say, I don't know even whether Jesus can accept you. I can accept you. When I was dating my wife many years ago, we had a misunderstanding and we broke up. It hurt me and I lost around 15 kilos in one month. An average of half a kilo every day. I remember she came to pray and I was the papa. And I was the one leading prayers. We used to have what we call push. Pray until something happens. At St. Francis, just beside St. Francis, that's where we'd meet. So this hot girl comes in. Remember, she has chucked me. Oh, I chucked her. I don't know, but somewhere there. But someone chucked the other. So she comes. We used to stand in the circle for one and a half hours praying. So she comes. Then I see her lifting what? Hands. In my heart. I was looking at her. I think she's also praying. The word I use in my heart is she's even lifting holy hands. Those hands cannot be holy. Then after that, I sent her a message. I said, you are lifting holy hands. Those hands are not holy. <laughs> I was mad. How can she come to pray? Now, some of you are laughing at me, but you have done the same thing. <laughs> that neighbor. Has that a what? Encounter. Ha. They, uh -huh. There's no difference. Let me tell you, I saw my wife lifting hands and I felt, you know the chimango that is here. <laughs> but remember, I am papa. I have to, you know, church can be funny. You have to be nice to but I said I have to send her a message. Now, what is the difference between me and the Pharisees? And the, sorry, and the Jews. And Paul illustrates that and says this in verse, let's go verse 20, 29. Verse 29, he says this. Oh, is he the God of Jews? Uh-huh. Oh, is he the God of Jews? Only? Is he not also the God of? Gentiles. Then he says, yes. Of the Gentiles also. Yes. For sweetie also lifting holy hands after chucking me. Yes. Next. He says, since there is how many gods? One. Now there's a doctrine that says, no, 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 no. no. There are many gods so long as there are many ways. The Pope two months ago said 
he was visiting Asia and says, no, 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 we are all of the same God. It's not true. The Bible says we have one God who will justify the what? The circumcised by what? By, faith. by what? By faith. Not by law. It is by what? Faith. So you Jews who think you kept the law, it is potter. And then he comes to us and says, and the uncircumcised also what? Through? What's the common de denominator there? Faith. Shout it loud. Faith. What's the common denominator? Faith. It's always been by faith. Hallelujah. Now, when I reached here in the morning, the Lord spoke to me and said, just go back and, and go narrative through the text because I, I flipped the points. Now, let's go back to verse 22 and just expose. The next thing is, it says, now let's talk about this faith thing. What does it mean? The scripture says, even the righteousness of God or the right standing of God through faith in who? In Jesus Christ to all and in all who believe for there is no difference. So this text is saying this, if you want to be righteous before God, you have to put your faith in who? In Jesus Christ. If your faith is not in Jesus Christ, there's no righteousness. Next verse. He says, all have for all have sinned and fall short of the glory, all of them, whether you're a Gentile, whether you're a teenager, whether you, uh, by the way, the teenagers here, your mom, your dad, but you already know that. They are all what? Sinners. But you know that, right? You live with them. For all have sinned and fallen <laughs> short. Verily is looking at me and smiling. And fallen short of the glory of God. Next. Being justified freely by his. How are we justified? By what? By grace. And it is a free gift. So the scripture is saying that in order for you to be just. And someone said to be justified means to be just like you have no sin. In order for you to be just like you have no sin, the scripture says being justified freely by his, this is capital H, it's important. Capital H, his meaning Jesus' is grace. So grace and Jesus are synonymous, they're one. Whenever you're speaking about Jesus, you're speaking about grace. And we said grace is the unlimited, the amazing, undeserving favor that God puts on us through Jesus Christ. So the text is saying being justified. Because we said justification is being acquitted of your guilt. Right? So Jesus is telling us. That we, God is telling us through the text of Paul. That we were acquitted freely by his what? Grace. Through the redemption. I told you the word redemption means to buy back. Through the redemption. That is in who? The redemption is not in any other person. It's not in Muhammad. It's not in Buddha. It's not in works. It's not in the laws. It's not uh, the one in the western Uganda is called who? It's not a, the redemption that is in who? Christ Jesus. To be right before God. Being justified. Is by grace through faith. I'm going to teach you what those two words mean. Next. He says, whom God sent forth as a propitiation. And I told you propitiation means that the righteous that God paid and fulfilled a sacrifice so that his anger was pleased. So the good news with that, the Bible says forth as a propitiation by his blood. What mean, that means is this, God is not mad at you. God is no longer angry at you. Because the word propitiation means that the, his anger was appeased. That is so profound. Because many of us approach God from a place of, even the Luganda song, Mokamoli waguru, eyo, bereyo. Fetuberewa, wano. No, 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 no. God is not angry at you. God is in love with you. 
God is in love with you. Come on, give him praise. God is in love with you. His anger was fulfilled by the blood of Jesus. So that we sinners, there's a story in the Old Testament. Moses goes and meets God. He comes down and is glowing with the presence of God. And the people tell him, ah, you and God, you finish your what? Your business. No, 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 no. Now God is saying our business was finished. You and I, I call you a friend. That's why in John, should be eight. He says, I no longer call you slaves. What do I call you? You are my friends. I have some good news for all of you. God is your friend. God is your friend. God is your friend. By the way, that's what sets Christianity apart from all other religions. All other religions, Katunda Tumtawanya. Omugenda Kochi. <laughs> no, ours, God is pleased with us. Because of the sacrifice Jesus made at the cross. And his anger was satisfied. So whether you return the Lord's tithe or not, he's pleased with you. Tell your neighbor he's pleased with me. Come on, tell them you're pleased with me. So let's continue. He says, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through what? Faith. To demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, the, the easier word there, in his patience, God had passed over the sins. Other version says God has, had covered over the sins that were previously committed. Meaning that, mukama muchisache yakorachi yavikako. Why? Because he knew he was going to deal with it. Next verse. He says, to demonstrate at the present time his what? Righteousness. The reason why he covered, the reason why he was patient, he was awaiting for his son to come and atone for our sins. He was not excusing sin because sin has to be dealt with. Are we clear? Then he says this. Let's go. The time of his righteousness that he may be just and the what? The justifier. These two words are important. Meaning just, his character cannot change. He said I'm a just God. Meaning that I have to punish sin. But also I'm going to make a way. That's the kindness of God. You remember chapter 2? He says I am just and I can see my children. The law cannot save them. Now what do I do? Let me be just because my nature has to be just unless I lie. But also let me be the just fire. Let me send them Jesus to be their redemption. That act being just his character and being the means through which we receive the righteousness of God is simply called the grace of God. Let's give him praise. It's called the what? I want you to compare this with exams. You know, your neighbor can set exams and they are hard because they have to set the what? The exams. So God set the exam. His character is the exam has to come. But at the same time, God so he set the exam. Then the day to sit the exam, he leaked the exam. He is just, and he is the what? The justifier. If you are in S4 and you're going to sit mathematics, number one, number two, number three. I'm not saying you go and get the kasasi, but that's what God did. He made sure every number, 
Uh, now the teachers are here saying, Pastor, what are you teaching? Our kids, they don't need to, they need to read. They, no, that's the grace of God. That God sets the exam and he gives you the results, the answers to the exam. And he makes sure you remember all the answers. That's called the grace of God. That's why many of you cannot even understand. Now some of you are saying, but why even set the exam? He's God. Now, when he did that, let's go to verse 27. People said, no, 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 no. Let's go to, to demonstrate, verse 26, to demonstrate to the present time his, that he is, that he may be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in who? Christ. So grace. Grace is Jesus. We are made right before God through what? Grace. We are justified through? Uh, by grace through faith. I wanted to say that. Let me, pardon me. We are justified by grace. But the way we receive grace is through what? Faith. Faith is the vehicle to receive grace. The challenge is the world has its methods. The first method the world says and Paul refutes that he says the law. By observing the law, you never reach grace. Are we together? Are we together? John, you come here. Let me illustrate this because I want you to get it. John, come. Pastor John, come, come. Run, run, run. Mumsa John Muganda. Yes. Now, just imagine Pastor John is grace, is Jesus. Right? Uh, the sinner, you come. Okay, not Jesus. <laughs> Come on, run, 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 run. Be there. Now, this is the law. The Ten Commandments, right? Now, for a Jew, he wanted to reach Jesus or to reach God through what? The law. You come here. He says, for a Jew, just imagine I'm a Jew, I'm a person. In order to reach grace, I need to go through what? The law. I observe the Ten Commandments. I go for Sabbath. I am faithful to worship one God. When I do this, I'm hoping I'm going to reach who? Grace, Jesus. And Paul writes and says, no, 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 no. Even if you tried to observe this man, the Ten Commandments, James says, James 2.10 says, just by not observing one, you have what? failed. It doesn't work. So he says let's put the law aside. He says now all I want you to do is to have faith. Now faith becomes the vehicle in which I access what? Jesus. Grace. So some of us are still wanting to keep to first go through in order to reach it will never, the, the world is, it will what? Never work. The new way is simple. Believe, simple. Believe faith works. He says, believe that you can reach grace by simply what? Believing. You may be seated. Some of us, Mugamba Apana, there has to be another thing. No, the scripture doesn't say there's another thing. Then, some people came to Paul. This one is my addition. And told him, no, 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 no. Okay, we understand the law. But they said, what about a bikolwa? What about what? It works. I love what Paul says. He says, let me answer you. Let's go to verse Chapter 4. We want to look at, doesn't every color work? The works, right? Let me read it here. He says, but, we, but then shall we say that Abraham our father was found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by what? I can't hear you. By what? What's works in Luganda? 
So if he was justified, he says, okay. Since you're asking me, if he was justified by works, he has something to boast about. If it was works that he was circumcised, uh, he prayed the Lord, he fasted the Lord, he raised children the Lord. Whatever. If it was works, he has something to boast about. But he says, ah, 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 but not before God. Meaning your works are like filthy rags. Next. For what does the scripture say? The scripture says this. Abraham what? Shout it loud. Abraham what? Abraham did what? Uh huh. So the scripture says Abraham had no works. Abraham believed all he did was to have faith in who? In God. And when he had faith in God, it was imputed. The word account is an accounting language. When someone accounts, puts an, an account on your account, it means he has credited you. He gives you, he imputes you. So the Bible says that God, when Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him to be what? Righteousness. How? How? Because now people were arguing. But does this thing, is it is that really true? Let's go to Genesis. It should be 15. 15, 6. Huh. Now we are in Genesis. Where are we? I want you to know Abraham was before the law was. Before the law came into existence, Abraham was. So Paul does not even make an argument about the law. He makes an argument about works. And he says this. And he believed. Who believed? Abraham. Shout it loud. Who believed? And he believed in the Lord. And what happened? And he accounted him for righteousness. So his righteousness, his right standing before God had to do with believing, not doing. Let me say that again. It was not about doing, it was about what? Believing. Hallelujah. Because verse, verse 4 says, Now to him who works, the wages are not accounted as grace, but as what? Debt. Meaning that if you have worked your way, you have a wedge, you have something, it's an IOU, if you're an accountant here. You have to pay me because I have what? I've worked. And if you don't pay me, it means that you have what? Indebted. But Abraham could not say he has a debt because he didn't work for it. For him to be called out of the Chaldeans and being brought and be the father of all nations, it was about only one thing, believing in the finished work of God. You see, many of us come from a reward system, especially if you're a parent. When your child does something good, what do you do? You want to reward them. So such systems tell us, even when you come to the Lord, let me do these things so that God can be pleased with me. The works gospel says, let me do and do and do and do so that God is pleased with me. I have some good news with you. God is already pleased with you. God is already pleased with you. There is no amount of work that you can do to account, to put a credit on your account. So Paul says, and to him who works, the work wages are not accounted as grace, but as what? debt. But thanks be to God, we who don't work, we are already accounted by what? By grace. Through faith. Next. He says, but to him, uh, he's so good, but to him who does not work, but what? Believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for what? You are right before God because you just believed in the grace of God. I was called to bury some politician in Gulu. It was one of my worst services. Because they said, before I preached, I think they were setting me up. They said, this man built a church. But this man also contributed. They told me all the itinerary, all the things he did. And they said, surely, Mukama inomula musa chisa. But Paul is telling us, your works can never bring you before God. You'd never come where your works. 
You come by faith in grace. Some of you are too far away from God. I have some good news for you. Stop working to earn his position. What you need to do is to believe that God, you paid it all and he paid it all. Come on, give him praise. I want to end, because my time is fast spent. I want to end with a couple of verses. He says, he brings in David. And David said this. David says, just as David, who describes the blessedness of a man whom God imputes what? Not whom God says, you work and I give you righteousness. God imputes righteousness. Not by works. Even David knew that in the Old Testament. What a revelation. Tell your neighbor, stop working for salvation. He ends by saying something about circumcision that was amazing. He says, does the blessedness then come from the circumcised only or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to who? To Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted while he was circumcised? While, was, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? What is the answer? While he was uncircumcised. Because the Jews were saying, no, 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 no. He was, he was circumcised, that's why he was righteous. No. Chapter 15, verse 6, let's read it. It says, he says, and he believed, come on, let's read one, two, three, go. It was believing. This is, it's, it's chapter what? 15. Circumcision happens in chapter what? 17. 17. 11 says, uh -huh, let's read. One, two, three, go. So Abraham was circumcised way after he had what? Believed in verse what? 15. So it's never about our circumcision. It's never about our tithes. It's never about our buildings. All those things, we do them because we are saved. The good works you see, we do them because we are what? Saved. The best way to illustrate that is this. No one has ever come to me. My daughters love swimming. They have never been in the pool and they come out dry. Can you swim and come out dry? When you enter a pool, what happens? You are what? Shout it loud. When you enter a pool, what are you? You become what? Wet. The day you believe God and believe this grace, it is impossible for you it is what? Impossible for your life to remain the same. Good works come as a result of believing. Not believing to have good works. The reason I'm faithful to my wife is because I believed the Lord. I'm not faithful to my wife so that I can receive the, the Lord. The works come in because of the goodness of God. So if you are here and you have believed the message of the works, it doesn't work. If you have believed observing the law, it doesn't work. We observe the law. We do the good works because we are born again. Okay. Would you bow you? Father, in the name of Jesus, I do thank you for your abundant grace that has nothing to do with us, that has everything to do with you. Right now, I pray in the name of Jesus for those that are in this place and they love you and they want to receive you. I pray for your grace to abound. 
Those who had thought you were mad at them, today they know you are not. Those that thought you are far away, today we know we receive you simply by grace through faith. 